Welcome to another episode of Talking With Docs. I'm Dr. Bradman. And I'm Dr. Paul Zalzo. Okay, we're talking about another question, a comment from a viewer who was asking the difference in types of hip fractures and how it affects the treatment for their, for their loved ones. Yeah, you'll have one person who says, oh, my mom had her hip fixed. Oh, my mom had her hip replaced. Right. Why? Why the like, different treatment? Yeah, why the different treatment? So, okay, so let's talk about hip fractures. So, yeah. So who, who gets hip fractures typically? Well, typical, the typical hip fractures that we see in the absence of a significant trauma, like a motor vehicle collision or fall from a tall height, like a roofer or someone like that, yep. it's going to be an, the elderly population and usually it's this, uh, an osteoporotic fracture yeah. or a fracture that uh, occurred uh, because of the presence of osteoporosis. Check out our other video on osteoporosis. Right. Um, so the bones are weak and they break usually just from enough trauma from a fall from a standing height. And they're weak just because as we age, our bodies are in a constant state of building bone and resorbing bone and resorption slowly wins over the course of our life without significant intervention. So definitely something to talk to your family doctor about. So, okay, so you've had a fall from a standing height, you kind of teetered over, fell yeah. down. Yeah. How, do you, how do you present or what are your symptoms? Do you just get up and you're like, oh, something doesn't feel quite right or? Very rarely <laughs> you present like that. Yeah. Although sometimes Every you now see and people, then. I fell last week and I've been limping. It is. But the majority of the time it's pain. Yep and inability to weight bear. Probably require an ambulance. Yeah. Yeah, because you don't want anyone to touch that leg, look at that leg, move it, talk about it. Yeah. You really need some professionals to typically get you onto a stretcher or a gurney and then bring you to the hospital. So when you get to the hospital, just like everything else we do, history and physical examination by the emergency room doctor, they may notice that the leg is a little shorter or externally rotated because of the way that it broke. So um, those bones are kind of pushed up a little bit. Um, and then pain in the groin most commonly. Mm -hmm. but how do we diagnose it? X-ray. Yeah. That's our friend, really, in orthopedics. Yeah, thank goodness that was invented. The Rowentogram. Thank the you so much for inventing that. Whoever did, we'll have to look that up. Yeah, I think him. Rowentogram? I think Rowent? So. Yeah. His name wasn't Graham, I don't think, but Ms. Graham. Rowan. Yeah. Maybe it was Rowan? Maybe. Thank yeah. you, Rowan Atkinson, <laughs> for inventing the X-ray. Okay. So you get an X-ray, and then really there are two general types of hip fractures, right? And we think about them when we're talking to the emergency room doctor or booking the case with the operating room, either the fixable ones or the replaceable ones. So what's the main difference? The location. Okay, can we Just show an like x-ray? real estate. Oh. Location, location, location. Nice. Um, yeah, I'll have to dig up an x-ray and put one in here. Okay, so here there may or may not be an x-ray in this video that shows that the type of fracture that usually needs a replacement is high up in the femur. Right. Subcapital, we call it. Okay. Close to the femoral head, it's like I always say, like the ice cream cone fell off the cone. Really? Right. The yeah. ice cream fell off the cone. Yeah. And so, too. and we think about that. So some people say, well, why can't you just take the ice cream and put it back on? So physically, like say you opened up someone's hip, you, you physically could put it back on, and you could hold it there with maybe a plate or some screws, a bunch of things. But what's the what's the main reason that we don't routinely fix the ones that have fallen all the way off? In, in very young people, we will try, yes. but in the vast majority of the time, we just take that broken off piece and give it to the pathologist and replace it. Um, because this gets a little technical, it has to do with the blood supply. Yep. It has a retrograde blood supply. Most of the time, blood supply in the body goes from proximal to distal. So antigrade. Like antigrade. Yeah. As opposed to uncle grade. So if I put a tourniquet on my arm up here, then I cut the blood off in my hand. Right. It's the opposite direction with the femur, where the blood's coming from away and moving towards the central part of the body. Yeah. Retrograde blood flow. So when you, the bottom line is, if you have a fracture that's high up like that, you cut the blood supply and the femoral head can die. And that's called? A vascular necrosis. And so the x-ray during the surgery, if you're using imaging or afterwards, looks fine. But then slowly over time, the pain comes back, the x-ray starts to look funny, even the ball can start to collapse, the hardware can fail. So that would then require more surgery. So studies have shown that in certain types of fractures, displaced femoral neck fractures, that it is better to go on to a replacement. So when you replace it, do you do a half a hip replacement? Do you a whole, whole hip replacement? What do you do? Controversial in orthopedics for, for sure. many years. Either go hemiarthroplasty, which is half a replacement, or total hip replacement and just replace the socket as well. Yep. Hemiarthroplasty is always winning that argument. So the vast majority of the time, you get a half a hip replacement or a hemiarthroplasty, right. where you keep the socket and just put in a new uh, femoral head. The main reason to consider a total hip replacement would be in someone that had pre-existing, long-standing advanced arthritis because that metal ball on your arthritic socket might cause ongoing pain. And we don't just jump in and replace the hip 
right. every time because surgical time is a bit longer. And studies have shown that the dislocation rate, if you do a total hip replacement, uh, seems to be a little bit higher right. uh, in the setting of trauma. Okay, so femoral neck fractures, we replace the ball either in a hemi situation or a total hip replacement. What about the fixing? How, what are our options for fixing these types of fractures? So now you have a lower down fracture yep. into the femur, into the proximal femur. We still call it a hip fracture. Yeah, what's another fancy name that some people call it? We, we, we describe it as an intertrochanteric fracture or a sub trochanteric fracture because right. the trochanters are those two bumps in the proximal okay. femur. Uh, and the fracture goes between those two or a little bit lower yep. than that. That's called an intertrochanteric fracture, subtrochanteric fracture. And those, we fix those fractures. Right, and because the blood supply to the femoral head is preserved in this yes. type of fracture, that's why it doesn't die, because you're like, well, didn't you just say that the blood comes from the... Good point, yeah. Right? So the location of the fracture implicates the blood supply, so we try to fix these. So how do we fix them? We fix them. In a uh, cast? Yeah, put you in a big cast <laughs> from neck to toe. No, we don't do that. We we, we have to use metal we do. Okay? Uh, and screws. Yep. And so the two main options is a, is a plate on the outside of the bone with a yep. screw that goes into the head. That's a sliding hip screw. Sliding hip screw. Popular about 10 or 20 years ago, less so now. Would agree. Now we lean more towards an intramedullary device or a rod inside the femur with a screw that goes through the neck into the head. Yeah, and you can show, we'll show a couple of little pictures uh, of that too. Okay, try and show. Well, we may or may not show up. pictures of that. Paul's going to do it. I can really feel it. So that helps you understand. And what's, what's the difference in the post-operative recovery for these two groups of people? No real difference in the post-operative right. recovery. Do they you get to walk on know. it right away? Yeah, you're going to walk on it. And you see two people walking, you won't know which one they had. Yeah. Uh, it's just a sort of preference thing by the surgeon and yep. sort of the literature starting to show that with that intramedullary device, uh, it's load sharing. So it doesn't shield the bone from all the load. So that allows the, load, the bone to heal. Right. Okay, so taking both of the types of hip fractures, these people are in the hospital for say three to five days, sometimes a little bit less. You, once your pain's controlled and you can get around with a walker, you pretty much get to go home. It's variable because sometimes this fracture is the defining fracture that indicates your living environment is no longer safe and you may yeah. not be able to go back to that living environment. Yeah. As where you may need to look at an assisted living environment. Yep. And that's a battle that always occurs between the kids and the parents who are like, hey, it's time for you to go to assisted living or move in with us. And the parents and the elderly folks are like, no, I want my independence. Why yep. would I want to live with someone Which else? Is understandable. Right? Very understandable. And this is often a sign, yeah, that your health is declining a little bit. So um, the purpose or the goal of the operation is to try to get you back to where you were before. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're probably not going to be better than you were before the surgery, but our goal is to get you as close as possible. But certainly a significant population don't quite get back there. And this is a very... A hip fracture is a very real, significant event. Even getting you through the operation uh, typically is not a big deal, but afterwards there are very real risks. So um, this will all be discussed with your other physicians involved for mm -hmm. sure. Is there any mortality associated with the hip fracture? Uh, unfortunately there is. It's again, typically not like the day that it happens or during the operation, but over a period of six months following all hip fractures, the, the mortality incidence has been reported as high as like 30%. It's quite high. Yeah, it depends. It's stratified by age. So yeah. obviously the older you are, the associated one year mortality goes up. And in an elderly, elderly population, like in your 90s in our province, the one year associated mortality can be over 50%. Yeah. Uh, so there's definitely a range there, but there is an associated mortality with it. So it's a big deal. It's a serious injury right. um, and it needs to be treated as quickly as possible yes. and then close follow up after. Right. And it's often an indicator, as you said, of the rest of your health and the rest of your living environment. So yep. Um, just quickly for the post-op care, so pain control, often anticoagulant for a variable amount of time depending on uh, your surgery and how mobile you are, physiotherapy, mm -hmm. um, usually a couple follow-ups with your doctor, use for stables out and then maybe like a six-week follow-up to make sure everything looks okay. Yeah, and it, it's very common. Yes. These are the good news. It's yeah. very common. So consequently, we're very, very good at treating it as Great. an orthopedic community. Yep. We're very good at treating it and treatment is very very successful yep um you just have to be aware that there is an associated mortality with it but most of the time you do very well with a hip fracture and you can return to as close to your previous life as, po life as possible but it may be an indicator that you have to change some things in your environment and i think to your point about the risk after the fracture ideally we'd love to prevent these fractures with good osteoporosis care as well as good care to reduce your risk of fall so whether that's yeah. no rugs balance training uh, assistive aids, there's lots of things that can help reduce your risk of falls, but in general, getting an environment and your own personal health in a way that reduces your risk of falling is even more critical, so ideally right. avoid the fall. An ounce of prevention can prevent a pound of metal cure. 
I just made that I up. I feel like you did. It's pretty good though. I don't know. If you like this video, please like it. Subscribe to our channel and share it with someone that you know that has or has an imperfection. Remember, you are in charge of your own health and your own living environment. We'll see you next time.